So we sort of talked about growing up as a mixed girl in Wales, in Cardiff. Yeah. What was the good things about it, would you say? Let's talk about the great things you found about having two different heritage, like two different worlds in your life. I was really proud, and still am, of being from St. Kitts. I felt quite special, even though, say, people would pick on me, my hair, or there were issues. I was quite, I had the coolest dad in the world, let's say. A big boxer, we're from the sunny island somewhere. Wales is where I go to school every day, and I don't do very well, and it's raining, and it's cold. And at the time, no one was proud of the, of being Welsh, and it was, we were just getting English history anyway. It was nice to think of, oh, one day I'll go back home, because this isn't home. Really? Yeah, they it was always like that that's how I always felt like quite proud of it so the theme for you do you think how would you try and feel mixed and what would your word would be still mixed and confused but instead of saying mixed I just say Welsh because there is a connotation of Welsh and whiteness and my whiteness is connected to a Welsh her- a Welsh heritage so instead of saying mixed race I just say black and Welsh well but... and confused <laughs> Welsh and confused, probably, yeah, exactly. Welsh, black, confused. Because it's very much like a mixed heritage because, say, I love Wales because my last name is like Dunrod. That's a Scottish name. There's a place. So for me, I didn't really consider Wales to be my colonisers. My reparations should come from England and, and Scotland, let's say. My grandparents came here afterward. This might be bad. I disconnect my connection with that slavery, although we've got a very, our own very dark history of slavery. My family's in enslavers at the time my yeah. were Scottish and that's how you got the surname that's how we got the surname placed upon that family it's very much mixed and confused in all sense <laughs> the black part is easy actually I was always made to feel like I wasn't Welsh anyway so it's easy to attach to fine I'm Kittitian so I'm, I'm black I'm Kittitian it was easier because there is a displaced people let's say in the Caribbean we were displaced and that's very much how I feel in Wales so mm. it's easier to relate to that the good thing about being mixed for you was knowing that you had this incredible rich heritage that you almost or background culture that you don't always have access to and you feel like not many people know about it is sunny bright colorful cool like your dad is cool that was the great thing about it am i right definitely growing up lived abroad in greece in spain lots of places and what fascinated me about all these places was heritage and culture tradition we don't really have traditions of Wales we've got Christmas we've got Easter you know maybe we're St David's Day but say there are so many cultures that you know they'll do everything every they'll do something every day in the Greek culture for example I didn't even feel like we have food in our culture it was just so ooh, so Nan had really nice food at her house and it was just like this very nice yeah like the norm in Wales was just rain cold and slop Food. What was the difficulties for you growing up? We talked about hair. We know hair is a mess. What other things did you find difficult or confusing? At the time, it was my battle with my hair, maybe why my friends were kind of leaving me out in certain instances. Oh, let's bring Jess. Oh, being given the label Black Jess when someone else came into the crew. And then even though I was, we have different surnames and stuff. And I recently called this out on Facebook and got a lot of abuse. For the person because I always negated it I always said no she's black Jess because she's got black hair that was the hard part growing up I can only realize this now I've realized a lot of things since George Floyd and seeing people like say Afua Hirsch seeing her at play and then reading her book where my problem was that I had didn't have any language to call out what I was experiencing there was no unconscious bias there was no microaggression it was we were just about to say oh he's racist and dad is hoping we can make is to laugh it off even today is like, <laughs> the lack of language was an issue for me the way black people were portrayed I had no identity that so I was a bit of a tomboy I don't really know what was going on and if it wasn't for Beyonce and Aaliyah I don't think I would have had any friends in the high school 
let's say, because they were then cool and it was like, oh yeah, the sexualization of the black body in high school was an art, was a problem for me. There was me and a French girl who we were known for having really nice bums. And that was kind of, especially when I was in year seven, let's say in year eight, where I was quite a bit, my dad used to call me his dumpling. <laughs> I was the chubby one out of my, me and my sisters. My sister was the tall, skinny Naomi Campbell. And then I was a bit chubbier. So I was always a bit aware of my weight and Anyway, so to have people say, like, pointing out the part of my body which I was most self conscious about, because on Saturday schools and in black history, they don't say, like, oh, your bum is your, it's a black feature and your nose is. It doesn't really, it never at the time, it didn't stem. No one pointed out which feature was my African feature and which one was not. That was really the problem, really, for me, yeah. because I, the only black people in my school were me and my sister. There was a girl who was mixed race like us as well in my class. I went to primary school school one black boy in my class and that was it in the whole high school that was the only claim to fame really was that there is a perceived beauty in blackness because oh Jess has got a light skinned as well because it was only light skinned people on the tv I don't think I would have got that if I was fully black let's say I had a darker skin tone I think my life would have been way harder for me in that high school they probably would have sexualized it but they would have said negative things and it's also within the home I mean when my dad I, I'm sure I was the one who asked to straighten my hair but say so I'd come to dad tussle my hair oh I've blow dried my hair it's been easy to brush it today and dad is like oh what are you doing do you want it to be white and my sister would be like oh yeah you just want to be white yeah. but she's also like, like oh look at you you're an African in a negative way what was it because she'd watched coming to American she'd watched that picked up some lines and that's what she was calling me so you could never win even though she was exactly mixed it was just bizarre we went that phrase your hair is your crown which is the title of my book I never grew up with that type of black empowering phrases like black is beautiful be proud of it you know so that just wasn't available to us I have a major identity crisis that I don't think I will probably get through you're so right about not having the language as children or teenagers where we were probably picking up things or even in our adulthood to be fair I feel exactly the same as you until this last Black Lives Matter movement I didn't have the language and therefore I didn't actually recognize what I was putting myself through or what I was accepting in social situations and what they actually were yeah I always say this, it was a big awakening for me do you feel like when you were younger that you were going through bias or microaggressions or micro racisms I'm just making out micro racisms yeah. do you think that you just didn't know and you just couldn't pick them up but do you feel like now looking back they were there definitely I straightened my hair it went well I went to high school for the first time straightened my hair let's say and someone said that I look like an ape from the planets of the apes this, you know, I will never forget that or like say the boy that I was just madly in love with for all of high school. He was like, oh, your hair looks so much better straight. And I wore my hair straight into, for the rest of high school, you know, and it's quite sad. Even within the family, being mixed was confusing. You could do one thing and look white. You could do one thing and look too African or too black. That is the thing for mixed people, isn't it? Like you are neither one fully or the other one fully. And that's why I've asked you that question at the beginning, like how you identify as black. How do people react to that? Because I know that my black family sometimes tells me, not in a negative way, but they know I'm, it's really difficult. Like when certain conversations comes up, they know that I have light skin privilege and that comes from me being mixed. So I know my Nigerian family looks at me as a mixed person because they also know that I didn't grow up with them and I didn't grow up like knowing the Nigerian culture much because I had a white mom, a Turkish mom. Oh, that's horrible. No, I've never had that. And like you say, when I was in Nigeria, I was like pointed out as the white girl. Even Turkish people will sometimes say, you're not black. I've been told I'm not black. I've been told I'm not white. I love taking ownership of both sides because as I grow up and I let myself be more myself, I find bits that lives in me that makes me do things really like intuitively. And that could sometimes come 
from my African heritage and sometimes that could come from my sort of Mediterranean Turkish ha- heritage. So it's really weird to find myself close to certain music motifs, cooking styles and things like that. And they just come naturally. So I found this easier for me to like acknowledge that mixness. That's the way I survive now, basically. Well, that's quite interesting. Acknowledging the mixness. It is important, but for me, because I'm like a history buff, if we would acknowledge every mix, you know, it would go on for ages and ages and ages. Like my great grandchildren, who knows, you know, what they would identify as, because I think we're all we're all mixed. My family are quite, like, with my black cousins and sisters, like, might say my white cousins, I'm not really sure how they think of me as a black person. I know that they love me, but I know that there are some who probably wouldn't want to associate with me. And that's really sad to to think about. Yeah, some, you know, it's quite, and it has been quite prevalent, say, in my teenage years where we understood, okay, there were times where I thought, is it just because I don't look like the rest of the cousins? Whereas the black side, that has never been an issue. It's always been, we're just in Wales or in England because my grandparents came to Wales some went, as their children grew up. Some went to London, some went to Bristol. We would all congregate in Wales. We're black folk in Wales. It's just We're just black folk stuck in Wales. So it was never really a, it, we're just trying to survive really. We're, we have to maintain that condition because it's also, we always hear about Ghanaians. We always hear about the Jamaicans and we'll have to like you know we're Kittishan as well and we're kind of trying to because people in school would be like oh you're Jamaican da, 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 da. and I would be like yeah okay I guess so and ask dad like no you're not why is it that it's the Caribbean it's the West Indies what's the difference because I was really young he's like don't let them call you Jamaicans like, okay but now I understand I learned more history specific to the island how do you think that your mixedness or blackness is impacting the work that you do now you know you said you found yourself after writing this book created sort of art out of your struggles which is perfect because in Wales it's needed Mm -hmm. for other young black beautiful kids to not maybe hate their hair and understand that and this is why I am also wanting to do this so that youngsters don't feel alone and this is why we exist as mixed and confused so how do you think that knowing what you've been through personally is impacting what you do every day oh at the moment it's impacting it a lot and I do need to keep my mouth shut because I'm sure I'm missing really good clients. <laughs> it was George Floyd, to be honest, because I had Ambassadora before all of this because it's been about two years now with Ambassadora. And I always thought, oh gosh, I'm the only black woman in the room because I did networking online and stuff. So it was kind of anything I could do to tone down would be all right for work. But then George Floyd happened, my hair come out, Swiss launched Black Pound Day. And it was kind of like, you have a duty. Tell them you're black owned and tell them this Lily Translates was just purely a niche it was registered six months before it was actually launched because it took ages finding you to do my website now it's it's an everyday when I put my author head on I feel like now I wrote the book and it was so needed because when I wrote the book I didn't think anyone would care I thought it would be really good to show people you know I could translate books because I was opening a business for translating children's books I didn't anticipate that so many other kids were struggling I acknowledged there was a hair revolution going on in the world but I still had hadn't spoken to another black woman about it but I didn't speak to my mum either I didn't even speak to my mum about the fact like or any of my family about going to George Floyd kneeling with my dad and his missus and my son like three generations and not seeing like any of my family members that I knew my family members the black family were in Manchester Bristol London we were all out but not seeing like white family members it is quite because I've got brothers. Quite sad to acknowledge this. So I have a duty to speak out. My mum has always, has spoken out at times where she didn't have the language. Also as a white woman, Mm -hmm. she didn't have the language to speak out. And now we have the language and this is affecting my son. I've had to move my son to school because we've gone through two years of just racist nonsense from a primary school. So if I don't speak out because it's kids, not that I particularly like kids or I'm great with them. Those black tears. And it's that smug white look where you can give a microaggression. And if I tolerate that, it'll never change. Let's face it, I'm in my adult age that the psychological damage is done. It's all done. I've taken the abuse in my relationships, my professional life and everything. There's nothing that you can try and heal me, but I'm sure Alzheimer's comes from from trauma, I reckon. And I just don't see like how I could be repaired. But if everyone's saying they want an anti-racist Wales, okay, well, these are the ideas that 
that they've got so far, but you have to be willing to wipe the smokes off their faces, the people who are getting away with it. They're head teachers, they're looking after our kids, mm. they're, they're taking care of us when we're unconscious in hospital and our babies are across the room. You know, it's creepy what's going on. Actually, it is a horror movie, but getting people to even acknowledge that there's a horror movie going on, even getting people to acknowledge that, you know, there has been a 400 year long Holocaust gone on and there's been no interruption, you know, no healing has been done the generational trauma you know I see it with my grandparents and how they parent my dad she was he, apparently my nan was really cold and my dad is but well, I think my dad is just left without words now how he can explain what has been if he laughs it's better easier to laugh it off it's painful to live in Wales black especially when you see black Britain winning or say thriving but never really looking back for black Welsh and we're kind of at a moment now even in my professional life I'm seeing that Welsh stories are not being acknowledged as much as English ones so it's kind of I'm trying to start this revolution let's get black British authors into Welsh see that they can include us and and take it from there because I think up until now I've certainly grown up in Wales thinking I wasn't raised in Butte Town where the black area was I grew up in a white household thinking there were no other black people in car in Wales I thought I was the only one until I went to London because I knew my auntie lived in London but when I went to London and saw black people on the tube I saw smelt cocoa butter everywhere and went to Brixton and it was like, oh my God, I'm not the only one. I thought they were all in St. Kitt to be yeah. sheltered in such a small town in Cardiff. How do you feel that is changing now in Wales? The, you know, the acknowledgement of Black and Welsh? I think every Black and Welsh person will say, yeah, I'm Black and Welsh. I believe. I think that's where we are. I think people are impressed with Wales being, we're, we're doing great things in Wales with the curriculum mm-hmm. and stuff, but say the Betty Campbell Museum statue, everyone heard of that, but because they have no connection to the Welsh heritage, because they are a full divulged government, we all learn history, English history. But in Wales, we don't learn our Celtic brother and sister's history, or in England, they don't learn a Welsh language or them. So they didn't realise that it was the first non-fictionalised female ever in Wales and actually it was an even more monumental moment when we say decolonize the curriculum you've got to teach them why we're Welsh because there are you know I can't be that I'm growing up and then I'm learning about villages being drowned from Netflix of all things because they didn't teach us in the schools because Henry VIII was just so important to bang in every year you know and it wasn't even like oh look how he treated women it was oh you know had six wives he chopped his head it was kind of yeah he's quite impressive man look what he managed to do so it's all got to go and I'm, I'm happy that in Wales there's an opportunity and I am working on the Welsh curriculum now it's an exciting time but I hope that this will well the government need to actually pay the experts like uh, there is an amazing historian Abu Bakr Madam El Shabazz he needs to be commissioned to sort all of this out the government are a bit behind and I don't want this to be a tick box exercise where Wales can turn around in 2030 and say oh we went for a 20 um, an anti-racist nation and we're still pretty racist so ah, I guess it can't be achieved or for England to say well you're still racist so why the curriculum didn't work in Wales we kind of kind of we've got to do it properly otherwise the other nations won't follow through where can people find you and follow your work about the Welsh government and everything that you're working they have to follow me on Lily Translates and my Twitter I'm quite I call people out on Twitter. I love Twitter. Twitter's where I have my rants under my name. Is it just <laughs> Dunrod on Jay Dunrod? Yeah. Jay and then Dunrod, Lily Trans- that's yeah. That's and then Lily okay. translates on Instagram is where anything to do with children's books. We're going to the Senate with all the books that we're translating. So I will post it on there. I just can't keep up. Yes. You are doing very important work in Wales. And I think we're gonna keep hearing about you. So I am happy that I've gone I've got in there first. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, we can keep doing. I mean, my idea identity crisis will change so if you speak to me next year you know <laughs> I might actually you know go, go and live in the Caribbean and they'll be like no you're definitely white and go back really in a bad mood so you know I never know <laughs> how oh, it's going to change but I'm pretty sure I've just got to accept it now I've got two more questions and then we're done what is belonging for you so for me I think belonging is the climate I can belong anywhere I can make do with my for the art of attrition you know I can I can make do with anything I belong in Wales but that's my political statement and this year 
there has always been about reclaiming my Welsh identity and actually proper establishing it because I lost both of my grandparents at the end of last year, which for me, I felt like, is that my connection to the black side of the family gone, like the Caribbean? But it's my duty to carry that on because they're from Lan Rumney, so they're never really mentioned in the Butte town and and things like that so my belonging is actually me standing out here in Wales I'm not really sure I belong in Wales but I belong I'm telling everyone I belong here I'm taking my space so other people won't grow up feeling like they don't belong I belong anywhere where the sun is shining and people leave me alone that's where I belong in the sun last question hard question what would you say if this was little Jess do you know what I need production for this section from now on from now on I want a little photo of Jess if there was a little photo of Jess here holding it what would you tell your 10 year old self 10 year old Jess I would tell her you've got disabilities so you're never going to do good in school but eventually you will get degrees I would teach her the language that she needed because she could have called this this is a very easy book that I wrote I'm sorry I wrote it in one night it was very easy and she could have done that at 12 she didn't have to do it at 32 just don't listen to anyone don't trust your teachers don't trust your friends that's all I could say like don't listen to people you might have disabilities but that's okay there's another way this system is not built for you don't worry because you'll find your other way in the end so it's kind of you know it's going to be really lame but you'll get your way and I don't know it's still pretty lame I'm not gonna lie it's still pretty hard life you're gonna be used to struggling that's all I could really say it was the language I would have given them the language like yes black lives matter that could have (laughs) happened (laughs) yes 25 years. Yes, 10 year old Jess, Black Lives Matter, and your hair is your crown. Yeah, exactly. Wear it proudly and um, don't try and minimize your hair or yourself. Exactly. Yeah, stop straightening your hair. It looks terrible. Thank you so much, Jess. Right. To the end of our conversation which I actually feel like could be an all day conversation we could make a conference <laughs> together and sort of have chapters and sections um, and talk through it all day all night <laughs> <laughs>